This is uh, Electrical 2 Test 3. We hadn't done any of these questions here exactly before. New textbook. Switches are the least common means of providing control of electrical current flow to an accessory. We all know that's false. It doesn't take rocket science to know that's false. A digital readout of 18.6K on a digital multimeter is actually 18,600 ohms. Is that true or false? What's K? Huh? Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Throttle position sensors are variable resistors with two wires attached. Anybody know? Huh? That's actually... If this is a throttle position sensor, it's obviously got three wires, doesn't it? All right, so that's, that's obviously going to be a falsy. Reference voltage is the voltage signal that a computer sends out. That's right. Current flow through a diode can be identified by a band around the cathode end. What do you think about that? That's actually true. All right. Now, one of your worksheets today it deals with diodes. Some of these worksheets seem fairly simple. And the, the, the word to the wise is, when you've got simple worksheets in one course, blow through those and jump into the ones you're behind on in another course. Or practice something that you haven't done before. It's interesting, uh, Daniel told me the other day, he was working over there at, at Toyota, and uh, he was working with a guy that was doing brakes. And he says, um, the guy says, do you think, that, what did that, how did that go, Daniel? He said, guy, do you think this rotor is thick enough to where I can turn it and it'll be safe? And Daniel says, why don't you measure it? And he said, I don't know how. <laughs> Go figure. You see what I'm saying? All right. But um, anyway, number six. An inoperative horn is being tested. A digital voltometer is placed across the relay load contact terminals and indicates 12 volts when the horn button is pushed. A click is heard from the relay when the button is pushed. Technician A says the relay is bad. Technician B says the relay coil circuit is bad. Now that is a really difficult question to visualize. You got me? Whenever he talks about the relay load contact terminals, terminals. See this button? See this relay right here? All right. Now this right here is going to have typically going to have power coming into that terminal right there, and the, the horn is going to get power out of that terminal right there. These are the call. So you power and ground it, and it clicks. And what well, you're reading? 12 volts here. Right? You're reading 12 volts there. Okay. Now what should you read there? If you read 12 volts across the contact terminals, let's draw it. Let's draw it, guys. We got a call. We got our common. Let's do our. Let's draw it this way. Well, let's go ahead and do it that way. We all go this way. That's what that relay looks like. Okay, so we got B plus here, and this is coming out. I'm going to the horn and the horn is grounded, right? This here comes from the horn switch. We're just going to, we're drawing this a little bit different than what we ought to, but the same thing works. Usually the switch is on the ground side of the relay, but we're just doing it on the hot side just because. When I match this switch, this goes click and that jumps over here. Now this one over here is not used. This is going to go click, okay? Now, before I ever mash the horn, I'm going to take my meter and I'm going to measure right here. What should I see right here? Nothing. Think about it. That ground, that ground is going to come through that horn right here. And I'm going to read 12 volts. Yeah. Right? Because this, this voltage is going to, the path the ground is through that horn. Got it? Now, when you mash the horn button, that 12 volts ought to go away, and the horn ought to blow. Why should the 12 volts go away? If you take another meter, and you connect it here and here, I'm hooking at the ground, and I'm hooking at the wire coming out of there. This ought to go to 12 volts, but that ought to go to 0 volts. Now, why is that? It's not complicated. Actually, 
this ground has been neutralized up here because you got 12 volts on both sides of this. If this is working right, you'll have 12 volts in both places. So there's not going to, you're not going to read 12 volts if you're measured from here to here. But what you may read is a little bit of voltage drop across the contacts in that relay, which may be a third of a volt or something like that. You get where I'm going? All right, now let's read that question again. An inoperative, an inoperative, horn, an inoperative horn is being tested, a DVOM placed across the relay load contact terminals. That's the relay load contact terminal. This is the secondary side of the relay. This is the primary side. If you place a voltmeter across the contact terminals right here that would ordinarily come together, you're actually reading 12 volts when the button is pushed. You hear a click. That means you're, the relay is operating. The coil is okay. The relay is actually clicking, but it's not sending any power out to the um, horn. Got me? That, is everybody clear on that, or are we all confused? You understand what's in there? You learned, you, you understood relays after you took electrical, didn't you? Electrical one. All right, so that's how that works. Now, you guys all understand that when you're measuring, when you're looking at something that's relay driven, and that something is not working, if you get right here on the terminal that goes from the relay, I'm going to take my test light and I'm going to hook it to B. Plus. Then I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to hook my test light to this terminal here that's going out to my component. That test light ought to light up until I energize the relay, and then the test light ought to, that ought to go away, and whatever it is ought to be working. Because this ground right here is what's going to be burning that test light. Got me? See, I'm hooked to this. So that ground should be, this is hot, and that ground right there should travel through here, and illuminate that test light right there. If it doesn't, then you know that this component is either bad, that ground is bad, or you got a broken wire. That's the first thing I do if I don't hear a fuel pump. Turn on the key, I don't hear the fuel pump, I get the test light, I get it hot, I find the terminal, I find the fuel pump relay, I find the terminal that I know is going out to the pump, and then I, you know, that's a little tricky sometimes, but you can do it. And then I want to check that, I want to see if it lights up a ground. If it don't light up a ground, I know I got on a forward inertia switch is tripped, or the pump is bad. Sometimes we've actually gone on a vehicle and put the test light in there. It didn't light up. We kick the tank and the test light lights up and then it'll start. And then you know they got a bad fuel pump. You know the brushes are worn out and they're barely touching or something like that. See how quick you can figure out what's wrong? And a lot of the time your engine controller will be monitoring that circuit. It'll know that when it's turned that relay on it should see 12 volts there and when the relay's not on it should see a ground there. The engine controller knows that so you need to know it too. Is everybody clear on that? Booty, you understand what I'm saying? All right. What about you, Joe? Yes, sir. All right, then. All right. That's, and that's kind of like, you remember when I told you how to check that fan? How you hook the fan up to power, and you hook your test light up to ground, and you touch the, t the terminal that, you're not, that doesn't have anything hooked to it on the fan with your test light, and you turn the fan through and look for the light to go out? It's going to light up because it's going to be getting, you know, power through the windings on the motor. You turn it through, if it ever goes out, you got a bad fan. That's a one that's a one shot test, man. You're done. And that fan may work and may not, you know, because if it ever stops, it's like playing roulette. You know, it stops in the wrong place and ain't gonna run. Anyway, I sort of got off on a rabbit trail. But that's what this is talking about. These kind of questions here, if I don't explain them, you'll be just sitting there with a deer in the headlights. Look, you don't want to sound me what we were talking about. Okay, technician A says when testing a grounded circuit. Oh, incidentally, number six is A. Um a says the relay is bad. B says the relay coil circuit. The coil circuit is not bad or it wouldn't click. And I will tell you this. Let me take back up a second. Just because the relay clicks don't mean it's a good relay. So don't go by a click. I mean, it clicks good because it tells you part of the story, but you don't know the rest of the story until you know if it really will carry power. You got me? Okay. Um, technician A says when testing a grounded circuit, if a fuse blows as soon as it's installed, a short in the ground is indicated. Technician B says the component will not turn off if the short in the ground is on the ground side of the load component but before the grounding switch. See how these questions are so convoluted? You have to parse all of this stuff and figure out what's going on. Okay, a grounded circuit being what? When testing a grounded circuit, if a fuse blows as soon as it's installed, a short to ground is indicated. That's, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. I put a fuse in there, pop. Like my sister's Caprice, after my daddy put brake pads on it, it didn't have nothing to do with it, but the radio wouldn't work. She put her fuse in there for the radio because it was blown, pop. As soon as she put it in there, pop. She put about three fuses in there, pop. 
Finally, the parts guy says, quit buying fuses. you got some other problem, you know. So I took the radio, the chassis of the radio, loose from the car. I held it in my hand, and I plugged the fuse in, and it didn't blow. But I touched the dash, the metal part of the dash with the metal housing on the radio. Pop! It's inside the radio. End of story. And I went there and clipped out a bad capacitor and put a different one in there. It was a big old capacitor right on the end of it. Easy to find. I cut it, and it didn't do it anymore. So anyway, that was fairly easy to fix. But they were giving my dad a hard time saying, when you put these brakes on this car, you messed up my radio. It was working when they pulled into the shop. You know, it didn't have nothing to do with that, you know. All right, let me see here. Let me see. Uh, technician B says the component will not turn off if the short to ground is on the ground side of the load component, but before a grounding switch. All right, now what they're talking about here, this right here is going to require some artwork on probably several of these questions. I'm going to talk to Halderman about this. He needs to have pictures in here if he's going to talk about this stuff. Okay, so I've got a switch, right? Okay, and that switch is a grounding switch. Okay, all right. And this particular component right here is a light bulb. Let's say it's going to make a little light bulb here, and up here we've got a fuse. Okay. Now then, I put the switch, I mean, I put the fuse in there. You got it? Let me see if I can tilt that up a little bit. I put the fuse in there, and it goes pop. I know I got a ground right here, right? Probably. Right? I mean, see, I haven't even turned on the switch. But when I put a fuse in there, if it pops, I know I got to short the short ground somewhere before I even get to my load. All right? If the short of the ground is here, the dead gun light's gonna be on all the time, but the fuse won't blow. Right? Makes sense. Because it's just, just like you got your switch closed. Let's say that you get you rubbed against a bracket and your wire is touching ground. See that? Got that? So now that's what based on this little circuit here, let's look and see what they're talking about. Technician A says when testing a grounded circuit, a grounded circuit would mean like this. It's got a uh, short to ground that's not supposed to be there on that side. If the fuse blows as soon as it's installed, the short to ground is indicated. That's indicated if you put a fuse in there and again it pops. Got me? All right. Technician B says the component will not turn off if the short to ground is on the ground side of the load component. I'd be down here. Let's see that? You got that? Number seven is Charlie. Okay. You got that? All right, technician A says both an ohmmeter and a self-powered test light may be used to test for continuity. Is that correct? Yeah, you can use continuity means is this a good wire? I got a wire, I don't see if his wire is broke or a fuse or whatever. Huh? Yeah. Okay, well, the ohmmeter has got its own power source. It's the battery. The ohmmeter shoots some juice through there. You don't use, you don't test a powered circuit with an ohmmeter. It needs to be a disconnected from any and all power because the power comes from the meter itself. Okay, technician B says uh, both may be used to test fuses. That's right. The only problem with an ohmmeter when it comes to testing a load carrying circuit is if you can uh, you can cut a big old battery cable all the way in two except leave one little copper strand of wire, and that one little bit of that copper strand of wire will show zero ohms and it'll burn a self-powered test light, but it won't carry a load. It ain't gonna start your car, you know. Not enough there. Got that? So number eight is going to be Charlie. All right, let's go on through this thing. Num number nine, a voltmeter placed across the terminals of an inoperative electric window motor indicates 12 volts when the window switch is depressed. What does that tell us, guys? Probably. Huh? That's probably right, huh? Yeah, you got a complete circuit. If you're reading 12 volts, you know, uh, but... Sometimes the motor won't be bad, but the window regulator will be bound up. You know what I'm saying? And then what I do, here's what I do, and this is what this is my trick that I came up with my own self. I checked a lot of power windows, and they say the power window work. How many times somebody pull up to the drive through and they got to open the door to, you know, get out there? But anyway, so I push the power window switch with, you know, turn on the key so the power window will work. Push the switch, and I watch the dome light. If the dome light goes dim when I push the switch, I know there's power going to the motor, and we got a problem in the door. That's typically the way you do that. That's quick and easy. Not that much to it. Okay, so Daniel's probably is, is pretty well correct on that. Technician A says, Technician A says a window ground circuit may be faulty. Uh, 
Technician B says the window power feed circuit may be faulty. So number nine, neither one of those guys is right. Because if it's, it's going to have power and ground if you're getting 12 volts there, or if you see your own light go dim. Technician A says the fuse will automatically reset after the cause of an overload is repaired. Whoa, that's a joke. Technician B says when an overload occurs, protection device creates an open. Uh, that's a B is right about that. A fuse won't re reset itself, but a circuit breaker will if it's one of those really good ones, you know. Um, all right, technician A says maximum current flow will flow through zero ohms of resistance. Technician B says infinity will not allow current to flow. Infinity is when your meter is not reading anything, like you got your terminals out here, and if it's shorted, yeah, current's going to flow. So number 11 is C. Number 12 says a stepped resistor should be disconnected from the circuit before testing it. Technician B says a relay may be tested while it's connected to the circuit. Who's right about that? Both of those guys are right, basically. Um, but what's a stepped resistor? Somebody give me a stepped resistor. What is that? Yeah. Is it one of those? Is that one you Sort of. Huh? Where do you where's the mo where's the most common stepped resistor that you're gonna have on a car? You all you all aren't thinking about the right words. What about your fan? Low, medium, high. You got me? I mean, a stepped resistor, if you draw it in a schematic, a stepped resistor basically is going to have, and it's going to have several points along there. I thought I had another marker. Right. This is a very simple stepped resistor right here. Okay, now let's say that you're your component, your blower motor, whatever, is B plus. And usually the, this switch right here is going to be providing a ground to that. Okay, so basically when I'm running power, that's my switch. Okay, so I'm going to draw my switch so that I send power, I mean send ground to here. That's low blow. Okay, that's got to go through all of those to get to your blower, doesn't it? Okay, now then I'm going to click it to the next range, and all of a sudden my switch is sending ground to that one. Now it's only going through two of them, and the motor runs a little faster. Got me? Then I'm going to click it to the next one. It's only throwing through one, and finally on high it'll go straight to here, bypass the resistor. Got me? That's a stepped resistor. You'll see it in your wiring schematics. Sooner or later, you're going to have a blower motor thing. you say, oh, that's what he was talking about. This will burn in. You guys okay? Everybody understand that? Are you paying attention? Are you nodding your head even though you don't understand it? You know? I know what it is. You guys have a conspiracy. Don't ask any questions or act like you don't understand. We'll get out of there quicker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know how that works. Okay. Now then, let me see. Uh, technician A says damage can occur to solid state circuitry. <laughs> well, that's a no-brainer. If the charging voltage is allowed to get too high, whoa, now that gives a little qualifier, don't it? If the charging voltage goes too high, solid-state circuits can be damaged, right? Charging voltage is supposed to usually be what? 14. About 14 and a half. If the voltage regulator goes south, or, and I have seen this on rare occasions, centrifugal force causes the spinning rotor to fulfill itself because it's got an internal short and it's you know, caused by centrifugal force, and uh, it'll actually cause the voltage just to go out of sight, like 18, 20, 22 volts, whatever like that. Obviously, if you put too much juice in there, it's going to, you know, cook some stuff. Um, okay. Technician B says damage can occur if the vehicle is allowed to run with the battery disconnected. Ooh, who's right about that? Both of them. How many of you guys have been taught to disconnect the battery and see if it kills the engine to see if the alternator is putting out? Well, I've heard. Yeah. And the only problem with that is it'll cause a voltage spike. Sometimes it'll fry controllers and things. <laughs> Not a good idea to do that. It won't always do it, but it's kind of like it's kind of like you know having a 12-shot revolver and sticking a bullet in there. Go, eh, click, eh, click, eh, click. Hey, I can do this as much as I want to. Then all of a sudden, boom! That's what happens when you take the alternator loose from the battery. I got away with it that time. I've done this a bunch of times. This has been no problem. Oh no! Now the engine's quit running. We don't even have a good engine controller anymore. 
How much is that engine controller? Oh, $2,600. I'm sorry, sir. You need an engine controller. Well, it was running before it came in here. Now what are you going to do? See what I'm saying? It's not a good idea to take that battery terminal off when that engine's running. When the alternator can actually you know, shoot a spike into that stuff. And it, when it does it is when you least expect it. And now all of a sudden somebody's buying an instrument cluster and all these in a body controller. <laughs> you see where I'm going? That's nasty business. So don't ever do that. Now back whenever you were working on a Massey Ferguson tractor that had an old gas burning motor in it, yeah, that ain't a big deal. But on a car that's got 46 controllers on it, you know, in the dash and all this kind of stuff, and any little spike can go in there and cause one of their little circuit boards to go, you know, you know <laughs> that's not a good plan. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was much simpler, wasn't it, Rich? Yeah, it was, but um, the most common, the most complicated thing on most of those cars was turn signals. Um, but And that's, you know, that's when my dad was able to open a car and car garage when he was 28 years old in 1960 without having any training at all. He just put up a sign that said foreign car garage and started taking in work. And he had never worked on cars before and he started, he was smart though, he's real smart. He figured out how to fix, he could rebuild them six speed transmissions and all kinds of stuff because he was just a smart guy. But you can't do that now because things are so much beyond what they were back in 1960. You know, nobody was wanting to work on foreign cars because all these soldiers were driving them, you know, and everybody wanted to work on a Ford or Chevrolet or a Dodge. Brought a foreign car in there, they were like, eh, you know, get that out of here, you know. Only the foreign car around usually was Volkswagen, but a lot of them soldiers would come over here with uh, exotic cars, you know, like Jaguars and all that kind of thing. Anyway, he worked on 28 different kinds of foreign cars <laughs> when he first opened his shop. All right, right here is, um, let me see, uh, 13, there we got answer to 13, it was C. 14, technician A says, an open circuit has no brakes in the path. Yeah, excuse me, an open circuit that has no brakes in the uh, path, current will flow. If there's no brakes, if there's no brakes in path, so wait a minute. Yeah. How can it be an open circuit and have no brakes in the path? That don't even make sense, does it? Technician B says in a closed circuit, the circuit path is broken. Yeah. Both of those guys are yo-yos. Yeah. Technician A says a Zener diode is an excellent component for regulating voltage. Technician B says when a circuit is open suddenly to a large load such as a coil, installing a clamping diode provides a bypass for the electrons. Now that is a little bit complicated, but a Zener diode is basically a diode that, and this is, I'm going to simplify this as much as I can. A Zener diode is, huh? It will when the voltage on this side gets above a certain voltage. In other words, up to if it's, you know, in other words, when it gets up to 12.1 volts, all of a sudden, or whatever it's set for, you know what I'm saying? It'll all of a sudden start flowing voltage in both directions. So it changes AC to DC? No, it just actually just, no, 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 no. A, a diode is like a, uh, a one-way uh, valve for electricity. And you got a sheet where you're fooling with diodes. i got some diodes to give you. And you're going to be fooling with diodes with a meter and a light and all this kind of stuff. But, um... Instead of just letting it flow in one direction, whenever it, the voltage gets to a certain level, it will allow current to flow either way. So they're basically using that in voltage regulators. You know what I'm saying? So, so if the voltage goes below a certain, you know, it lets, so don't have to get that too deep other than the fact that a Zener diode will let it flow both ways if the current goes above a certain level. All right, so number, let's see, that was number 14, but no, number 15. Uh, technician B says when a circuit's open suddenly to a large load, such as a coil, all right, watch this. I got a air conditioner clutch coil right here. All right, I got B plus coming in, and I got ground over here. All right? Okay, now there's a switch that's going to operate that. All right, now the only problem with that is this is actually being monitored. This circuit right here is being monitored by the PCM in our fictitious circuit. All right, whenever you've got this coil is all saturated with magnetism and it's got that thing pulled in and then all of a sudden you open this switch, that collapsing field is going to create a big voltage spike that's like 400 volts. And where is it going to go? It's going to go screaming right through that PCM and it's going to knock it silly, you know, and that's the bad thing. But watch this. If you put a diode right here in between those two, all right, and you put it in there like that. You got to put it in there the right way. This current won't flow through this diode, but it'll flow around here to ground. It'll operate this. When you turn it off, 
that spike sort of chases its tail through that diode and goes away instead of going back up there. And I actually saw that on a Delville Cablevision bucket truck that had an air conditioner style clutch pulling a PTO that operated their bucket. It was a brand new truck. And every 30 days it would have to have a new radio put in it. And so they were asking me to check it out because the guys on the, in the new car department had already put three or four new radios in it. I'm talking about just a dash radio. And so I got on the dash radio, uh, the power feed in the dash radio on my oscilloscope, and I started turning things off and on. And when I turned that little sock, toggle switch off and on that operated that little clutch, I saw a big spike going to the radio. And whoa! And so the air conditioner does, I mean, it had a clamping diode. That little clutch they put in there, whoever you know, put that kit together for them to do that. Didn't think about what it would do, you know, with the key on, you're doing this, it goes back through the ignition switch, it went screaming over to the radio, and it was knocking the radio silly. The radio could take a few of those punches, but after a while, the radio would just eventually go dark. And so all I had to do was take a little bitty diode, like I'm going to give you guys in a minute to do your work these with, and I put it in there the right way, and all that went away. Wasn't hard to do, it was fun to troubleshoot, you know, but anyway, you know, but, um, Anyway, but you see, you got to think the right way. You know, they'd already swapped radios out until they were blue in the face. They wanted me, this needs to stop. You know what I mean? Whenever, whenever they give it to you and they want you to make it stop, and you don't have anybody to go ask, you just need to be smart enough to figure it out. Got me? All right. Uh, technician A says, okay, by the way, 15 is C. Technician A says, to test fuses, you could use a voltmeter or a test light. Technician B says, a voltmeter and a test light are hooked in parallel. Or the voltmeter and a test light hooked in parallel. In other words, one or the other. You hooked them in parallel with the fuse? Hmm. Voltmeter and a test light hooked in parallel. Okay, here's my fuse. Right here. B plus. And then we're going through a load of some kind. I always like to write a light bulb because it's easier to do. Uh, there's also a little switch right here. Obviously, got to have a switch. Okay, so I'm checking this fuse. How am I going to connect my test light? What am I going to hook my test light to? Huh? I'm going to hook my test light. Hey. I'm going to hook the test light to the ground, and then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to check here. And I'm going to check here, right? So is that test light parallel, or is it in series? Basically, it's going to be parallel with the load, isn't it? All right. So uh, so the, the voltmeter is going to be hooked up the same way, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so 16 is C. Both of them. All right, you got that? Number 17, which of the following is not true of forward bias in a diode? Free electrons in the N material and holes in the P material both move toward the junction. Oh, everybody ought to know the answer to these questions, shouldn't they, Daniel? N material electrons move across the junction to fill the holes in the P material. C, C negatively charged holes left behind in the N material attract electrons from the negative voltage source. Indeed, the free electrons that moved into the P material continue to move toward the positive voltage source. Now, is everybody totally lost on that question right there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, I will tell you this. This kind of question is more or less meaningless because you're never going to use that piece of information to fix a car. Right? But basically, just like I drew earlier, you got a diode that looks like, you know, in the schematic it looks like that. In the real world, it's got a strap right there. It'll usually be black. If it's a Zener diode, it'll be a little orange glass looking thing with a mark on it like that. If it's forward biased, then you've got power here and ground there. I mean, excuse me, duh. You got there and you got ground on this side. It'll flow that way, but if you turn it around and you have positive over here, it won't go back that way. So this forward biased means that it's able to go through. This is all we're in. I'm just going to throw you the answer to number 17. It'll be in your book, but you got, uh, and you're going to have to read that for your final anyway, but it's going to be C. To use a transistor as a simple solid state relay, what conditions must occur? The emitter base junction must be reverse biased, and the collector base junction must be forward biased. Hmm? Okay. What do you think? A. 
18. That's B, actually. The emitter-based junction must be forward biased and the collector-based junction must be reverse biased. Remember, anybody remember when I was talking about transistors last week? That's a transistor right there. We didn't have one. Yeah. Well, a week before last, whatever it was. P, P, N. That's a PNP transistor. And what that means is you got power here and you need power here. When you put a ground here, this power is able to flow. Got it? That's how a transistor works. You put a ground here, it's able to flow through. You remove that ground, your power is not there anymore. Okay? Now the other kind, now this right here is your base. All right, and on this particular one here, see, because ground always comes in from the bottom and power comes in from the top, we're going to put a ground here, and we're going to put a needed ground here. It needs to be grounded there, so when we put B plus on that one, this ground is able to go through. In this particular case, this is the collector, and this is the emitter, and that's the base. On the other one, this would be the collector, that would be the emitter, and that would be the base because we want to make sure power is coming in from the top and going out the bottom. Anyway, that's how a transistor works. Hey, Jim. All right, you got it parked out there? All right, we'll, we'll be there in a minute. Okay. All right. Okay, so number 18 is going to be B. Technician A says a shorted circuit can generate excessive heat. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Uh, technician B says a shorted circuit will cause the circuit protection device to open. That's right too. How many of you guys have accidentally hooked a jump wire up, jumper wire up, and got it hooked up to uh, power on one end, ground on the other? It turns into a smoke test and it just lets all the smoke out of it. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is the following is true about a clamping diode? A. It is used to protect some solid state circuitry. At two, it cannot be tested with an ohmmeter. B, excuse me, and then C, it is not used on modern vehicles, or D, it cannot be tested with a self-powered test light. Hey. Uh, I think it's C. What do you think? I think it's A. Well, if you've got a clamping diode, you got to remember how it's wired in there. You got me? Yeah, but you've also got, if it's going to be wired in there with that coil, so if you try to use your uh, ohm meter, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you're actually going to you use your meter, you use your test light. You're not going to be able to tell one way or another. Or can you? What about this? What if we tested it by putting power in? Now we take the coil, you know, with these wire plugs. We're going to disconnect, uh, you know, things that are going to confuse us, basically. Like we're going to fix it so that we can uh, so that we can put power in the one side of it and see if the power will go all the way through to the other side you know or can we do that yeah. because our, your coil being in there parallel with it is going to make a peculiar situation in it uh, uh, but we put it in to protect we put it in to protect solid state circuitry I mean basically that A is the answer they're wanting and I don't know where he's going with that because you're protecting solid state circuitry that's why you're doing that that's why you're putting it in there. But he's wanting A for the I mean, the guy that wrote the test. He wants A for the answer key. I don't like that. It looks, sounds to me like every one of these are right. You got me? You know, but uh, which of the following is true? Well, wait a minute. Excuse me, I read that wrong. Which of the following is true? Yeah, I understand that now. Okay. It's not, none of the other ones are true. Yeah, that's a screwball. Uh, reading, I messed that up reading it myself. How much resistance in a 12 volt circuit is drawing? Is in a 12 volt circuit is drawing four amps. Three ohms. Listen to him. He just did some math really fast, didn't he? A voltmeter that's connected across the input and output terminals of an instrument cluster illumination lamp rheostat indicates 12.6 volts with the switch in the maximum brightness position uh, in the engine off. Which of the following statement is true? Okay, that's input and output terminals of an instrument cluster illumination lamp reset. How many of you guys have turned the knob on your headlight switch and saw your lights go down and up? That's what we're talking about here, right? That little thing on the switch is basically a rheostat. I mean, although all that stuff's done a different way nowadays, but on the older cars you had a rheostat on there. Okay, so if you're reading, uh, if you're across it, remember like we spread up with a horn? Think about it. All right.
I need to draw that too. Okay. B plus. Okay. Here is stat. Now this looks like a throttle position sensor except it's open-ended. It doesn't have anything connected here. It's just got a slider that slides up and down this. Right? Okay, now we got a bunch of little bulbs here. Right? And these bulbs are all, there's the parallel circuit, they're all grounded. Alright, now then, we got our meter. And we don't know where this is. We get our meter here, which is 0 and 12. All right, we're going to hook the meter to the input and the output terminals. If I'm reading 12 volts here, what does that mean? How much voltage is going to those bulbs if I'm reading 12 volts there? Yeah, I'm reading 12 volts of the input and output terminal. Where am I getting a ground so that I can read that 12 volts? I'm getting it through those bulbs, right? That means there's no voltage going to them. Zero volts going to the bulbs. Are you familiar with that? Can you make it happen? All right. Okay. The number 22 is basically going to be B. Whenever a brake light, whenever the brake light pedal, brake pedal is pressed on the left rear and right, excuse me, when a brake pedal is pressed, the left rear and right rear tail lights and the left rear and right rear brake light of the vehicle illuminate dimly. Technician A says the brake lights may have a poor ground connection. Technician B says the brake light switch may have excessive resistance. See. That's actually A. Brake lights may have a poor ground connection. All right. So let's flip this over. A horn of a vehicle equipped with a horn relay sounds weak and distorted. Which of the following is least likely to cause it a problem? Let me pause for a second. Tell you when you got a horn that don't work, the first thing I always want to do is go to the horn and I want to disconnect the wires from it and I'll get my test light and see if it fires up my test light when I'm actually horn. But most of the time when a horn don't work, you got a bad horn. And my rule of thumb on electrical stuff like that is the component that's working the hardest and is in the most hostile environment is the one that's usually going to fail. That's true with a fuel pump, it's true with any, you know, a fan motor. And, you know, it won't usually be the control components. It can be, but I always look at the component that I think is most likely to fail, and that's the one that's working the hardest and is in the most hostile environment. Okay. So when you say like a horn fails, you're talking about like the actual button? The actual horn, no, the piece of work that makes the noise. Okay, under the one that's the, hanging the, underneath my bumper. Yeah, that one is hanging underneath your bumper, yeah. Okay, so number four, at D. Excessive voltage drop across the relay coil winding. You know, is is the least likely cause of the problem. Because if it's got excessive voltage drop across the coil line, then the horn's not going to do anything usually. The current draw of a window motor is being measured. Technician A says the ammeter can be connected to the power side of the motor. Technician B says the ammeter can be connected to the ground side of the motor. Who's right about that? Both of those guys are actually right. You can look at either side. Why does this one have four questions? No, that's all you're required to answer. Well, your YouTube video is 20 minutes long. For it four is. Questions. Yeah, it is. Unless they want to print it right. Do, all, do, the, do as much of them as you can. When you get to question number four, then uh, stop. And then I'll, uh, if I had to print another part of the test, that may have been an error in the printing of the test. And I got some of the test plots. Cool. All right. Now then, what are transistors frequently used as? How about, how about amplifiers and switches? Identify the three types of leads that both uh, NPN and PNP have. What did I tell you earlier? What are the three leads? Somebody spit it out. PNP, base, emitter, and collector. Bingo. That's it. All right. We're good on that. Let's flip that over. What electronic device functions is a one-way check valve that allows current and flow only in one direction? Dode. That's right. What solid-state electronic device only requires a trigger pulse to its gate to become conductive? That's a silicon-controlled rectifier. You know, we didn't really talk about that in this lecture here. A silicon-controlled rectifier. And then 30, what is a complex circuit of many electrical devices such as transistors, diodes, and logic gates called? We call that an integrated circuit. Integrated circuit. Okay, now finally we have an essay question. How do you like essay questions? Are they good? Are they our friends? Do I need to put 50 essay questions on the final? 
What are the differences between forward biasing and reverse biasing a node? I'm going to read from the answer key. In DC circuits, positive pressure or voltage always comes from the positive side of the battery. Therefore, a diode's action depends on whether the anode or cathode are connected directly or indirectly to the positive side of the battery. When a positive voltage is present on the P side of the, uh, or the anode, the diode is forward biased and current will flow through it. When a positive voltage is at the cathode or inside, the diode is reverse biased and current and flow is prevented. When a diode is forward biased, it's a conductor, it's an insulator when it's reverse biased. You try to run the current through it backwards, it ain't going nowhere. You run it through it forwards, it goes. That's the difference between forward and reverse biasing. Forward it goes. Huh? Yeah, that's in other words, if you put it on the positive side and the negative side. All right, now I want to show you something else right quick. Are there jumper wires down there where that juice box is? There are. Let me see a power and ground hooked to both sides of the juice box. See this thing right here? Now this little device, no, I need a hook to the juice box. Get the juice box. We have the juice. All right. All right. Now let me see. Let me hook me a power and a ground. I'll show you guys something real slick. This won't take but a second. It's not going to take a long time. This device right here is actually a capacitor, and you're going to notice that this particular capacitor has got a negative side. Now, they don't mark the positive side because there's only two sides. All they need to do is the negative side. Okay. So I'm going to hook. What happens, what's going to happen to this capacitor when I hook this power up to the negative side, excuse me, this ground up to the negative side, and this power up to the positive side? It's going to store that 12 volts. It is. Okay, now how will we be able to tell that it's stored to 12 volts? Well, you can't touch it and get shocked if it's just 12 volts. Now, if somebody's got a capacitor out of a distributor, you know, which is a condenser, and they've done that. Now, this little diode here, this little light emitting diode, this little light emitting diode is yellow, but it's got one long lead and one short lead. The long lead is positive. Okay, now when I touch, when I touch both sides of this lead to that, you see it flash? It was very brief, but the power that was stored in there came out and lit up that. All right, now here's another thing. This particular little LED, if I hook up power to it backwards, it nothing happens. If I hook power to it forward, what will happen if I hook power and ground up to this diode? Is it? You sure? I really hate to do this. Because if when I hook this up, it's going to destroy this diode. It will. It'll ruin it. Because you got to have a resistor in between. Now this one here may have too much resistance. If you got a well, here's one right here. I can use this resistor right here. It doesn't have to be a big ugly uh, ceramic resistor like this. But if I hook that up like that, oh no, I've got a problem here. Wait a minute. Let me see how many ohms that is. Or if that's a good one. Probably got too many. Too many ohms. All right, let's see what happens here. Let's see. You think I fried it with that capacitor? You think? Yeah. It doesn't usually happen that quick, but it came on and off real fast. Let me get another one. I got another one here. Okay. Remember, long lead is positive, and you can basically put this resistor in either on either side of it. You got me? Okay, so I'm going to take this resistor right here, and I'm going to hook it up to this right here. All right, I'm going to hook that to the long lead. I'm going to hook that. Okay, now, see, that wasn't even enough resistance to keep it from destroying that light emitting diode. You see, it, try, it kind of smoked out on me. And so that's the deal on that. If you put a, a more, more of a resistor in there, Let's try this. I'm going to another one here. This one here is a green one. All right. Now the cool thing about these diodes is you can go to Radio Shack and buy a whole box of diodes for a dollar and twenty cents. All right. You see that? Ta-da! See it light up? 
Now I got this resistor here is a pretty substantial resistor. And it just lights up and stays lit up. Isn't that cute? Ta da! You see, when you don't put enough resistance in there, or if you put no resistance, the smoke goes out of the light emitting diode. If you're building anything, make sure you remember that. You've got to have a substantial amount of resistance in there. Okay. All right. Now, for your worksheet I gave you out today, everybody's going to have to have a diode.